So last week we looked at the beginning of Hebrews 10 and that we no longer need to make sacrifices for our sins because Christ gave his life as the final sacrifice. And when we turn to him, we no longer need to carry the guilt or weight of our sin. Today we're going to look a little more, more at, at Hebrews 10. But first, I want you to pause this video for a minute or two or five and answer this question in your group. Have you ever continued to do something even though you were told not to? What happened? What were some of the consequences, good or bad? Now, I used to get in trouble for talking in class all the time. The teacher continually told me to stop. I'd apologize, the lesson would carry on. And eventually, my apologies meant nothing because I'd keep talking and I'd get kicked out of class. Either have to sit in the hall or go to the office and get in trouble. Now, I knew what I was supposed to do. I knew I was supposed to be quiet and listen. I had the knowledge on how to act, but I didn't act on that knowledge. And sometimes I'd be encouraged in the wrong way from those around me. Now, last week, we gained knowledge on who we belong to and how we become part of that family. So the question is, now what? What do we do with that knowledge? Well, Hebrews 10, 19 to 29, it says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Dear friends, if we deliberately keep sinning after we receive knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think, how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant, which made us holy, as if it were common and unholy, and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. It's almost like verse 23 to 25. It's a little reprieve, a little breather from what's about to come. See, we often use these verses and just say, this is what we need to do. And, and it's true, we need to motivate each other and encourage one another and we need to love others. But looking at this as a whole chapter changes things a little. It isn't just encouraging each other to do good, but it's encouraging each other to remember what Christ did for us and the freedom we have when we belong to him. We need to encourage each other to not hold on to the guilt or weight of sin, but to live with love, with the love of Christ in our lives. This may mean reminding others that we have forgiven them for what they did to us, and that they don't need to hold on to the guilt because we've forgiven them, and we need to forgive them really and let them go, let it go. But let's take this a little farther. Acts of love. What's love? Well, 1 John 4 8 says this. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. And love is God? See, verse 24 tells us to motivate each other to acts of love. Could it be we're to motivate each other to act the way God would act? Back a few years ago, okay, well, like maybe like 20, the big thing in the church and in Christian world was WWJD. Everyone had bracelets, bookmarks, shirts, you name it, it was out there, you could buy it. But really, in your current situation right now, with who you're dealing with and what you're doing, what would Jesus do? Are you facing something that you don't know what to do? Have you asked God? How would Jesus act? Would he get angry? Would he just walk away? Would he do nothing? See, often we read love and good works and we think it's the same thing. Well, 
maybe you don't, it's just me, I don't know. But there is a difference. See, good works are great. But good works with love, that's a whole new level of powerful. That's a powerful work. Mother Teresa, she said, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. When we do things with great love, when we do things with God, the world will never be the same. Now the verses that follow give a pretty serious warning. Now picture this, you're driving down the road and you hit a squirrel. Now, I actually really love squirrels. They remind me of Ontario. And I'm talking these squirrels with the big fluffy tails. Um, but you're driving down the road, you hit a squirrel. What goes through your mind? Well, probably nothing other than ah, no big deal, it's just a squirrel. But what if you hit a person? That's a pretty big deal. I'm sure you're gonna stop and, and work things through and make sure they're okay. Now, Jesus gave his life so that we can be free. This isn't like the old sacrifice where it was just an animal that gave their life. When we ignore the knowledge we've gained and continue to sin after turning to Jesus, we're told there's no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. Now let me say this, sin happens. It does, we all sin. Now the sin the author's talking about is when we consciously and knowingly make the decision to continue sinning. Meaning, we do it because our attitude is, I want to do what I want to do and hey, God will forgive me. Or maybe you just don't care and Maybe you just don't see what you're doing as being a sin because we don't fully believe what the Bible says about sin. Now when we treat forgiveness like this, it cheapens what Jesus did on the cross. His life was and is not cheap. Grace and forgiveness had a huge cost. Jesus' life. It's not just a squirrel. It's a person who gave their life for us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he wrote, he wrote this in The Cost of Discipleship, talking about cheap grace. He says, with cheap grace, some followers find a cheap covering for its sins. No contrition, no remorse required. Still less, any real desire to be delivered from sin. Cheap grace, therefore, amounts to a denial of the living word of God. In fact, a denial of the incarnation of the word of God. Grace not only costs the life of Jesus, but it also costs us our desires and our wants that may not line up with God's word. To ignore it, as Bonhoeffer said, is to deny God's word and to deny Jesus, the incarnation of the word of God. Now last week I shared that when we belong to Jesus, we belong to his family. And not all of us come from a healthy family. Jesus' family is uh, is not always healthy. We're not perfect. We're not going to get it right all the time. But next week when we wrap up this series, well, we're going to look at family and our role. So now why don't you take some time to discuss what stood out to you from these verses and what you and your group can do to help create a culture of belonging in our FAC student family. Love you guys. See you soon.